her song could have no ending. I saw her singing at her work and o'er the sickle bending. I listened motionless and still. And as I mounted up the hill, the music in my heart I bore long after it was heard no more. William Wordsworth wrote those lines, the last lines of his poem, The Solitary Reaper, two years after a journey that he had made round Scotland. But the source of the poem seems to be somewhat more complicated than simply a scene recorded and emotion recollected. During a visit to the Scottish Highlands, Wordsworth's Quaker friend, Thomas Wilkinson, had written an account of his travels, not to be published till many years later, but which he circulated among his friends. In that prose journal, Wilkinson recorded just such an encounter with a girl singing in Gaelic in the fields, and he noted that the strains of the music felt delicious long after they were heard no more. With Wordsworth, a personal memory and someone else's experience blended together, making something circumstantial into something visionary. Behold her, single in the field, yon solitary highland lass, reaping and singing by herself. Stop here, or gently pass. Alone she cuts and binds the grain and sings a melancholy strain. Oh, listen, for the veil profound is overflowing with the sound. No nightingale did ever chaunt more welcome notes to weary bands of travelers in some shady haunt among Arabian sands. A voice so thrilling there was heard in springtime from the cuckoo bird, breaking the silence of the seas among the farthest Hebrides. Will no one tell me what she sings? Perhaps the plaintive numbers flow from old, unhappy, far-off things and battles long ago, or is it some more humble lay, familiar matter of today, some natural sorrow, loss, or pain that has been and may be again. Whate'er the theme, the maiden sang as if her song could have no ending. I saw her singing at her work and o'er the sickle bending. I listened, motionless and still. And as I mounted up the hill, the music in my heart I bore, long after it was heard no more. The label that's always been hung round Wordsworth's neck is one that reads Nature Poet. Generations of school children have been brought up on his poem, The Daffodils, which we'll hear in a moment. And many people tend to imagine that most of his work has to do with flowers and hills and lakes a sort of lake district of the mind, full of the beauties of nature, with human beings rather thin on the ground. The fact that Wordsworth is thought of in this way is partly due to the man himself. After all, he did call himself a worshipper of nature, but the real force, the powerful strangeness of his best poetry comes through because we're made aware of the human side of this, of human nature as well as inanimate nature, and of man as an instrument through which nature transmits its messages. Such a vision could come to Wordsworth even in the middle of the biggest city in the world. In the summer of 1802, early in the morning of July the 31st, he and his sister Dorothy crossed Westminster Bridge on the top of a coach. And a month later, at Dove Cottage by Grasmere, he wrote this poem. 
earth has not anything to show more fair. Dull would he be of soul who could pass by a sight so touching in its majesty. This city now doth like a garment wear the beauty of the morning. Silent, bare, ships, towers, domes, theatres and temples lie open unto the fields and to the sky, all bright and glittering in the smokeless air. Never did sun more beautifully steep in his first splendor, valley, rock, or hill. Ne'er saw I, never felt a calm so deep. The river glideth at his own sweet will. Dear God, the very houses seem asleep. And all that mighty heart is lying still. His sister Dorothy, who crossed Westminster Bridge with him that day, was his closest lifelong companion. Reading the journal that she kept, we find her noting exactly the scenes and incidents which her brother would transform in his poems, the sonnet on Westminster Bridge, and in the Daffodil's poems. Walking home by Arlswater one day in April 1802, William and Dorothy caught sight of a long sweep of daffodils by the lake shore. Dorothy wrote about them straight away in her journal for that day, April the 15th, and two years later, emotion recollected in tranquility, Wordsworth turned the experience into something not only visionary, but solitary. I wandered lonely as a cloud, that floats on high o'er vales and hills, when all at once I saw a crowd, a host of golden daffodils, beside the lake, beneath the trees, fluttering and dancing in the breeze. Continuous as the stars that shine and twinkle on the Milky Way, they stretched in never-ending line along the margin of a bay. Ten thousand saw I at a glance, tossing their heads in sprightly dance. The waves beside them danced, but they outdid the sparkling waves in glee. A poet could not but be gay in such a jocund company. I gazed and gazed, but little thought what wealth the show to me had brought. For oft, when on my couch I lie, in vacant or in pensive mood, they flash upon that inward eye which is the bliss of solitude. And then my heart with pleasure fills and dances with the daffodils. A few years earlier, during the bitterly severe winter months of 1798 and 1799, Wordsworth and Dorothy were together in Germany, living cheaply and trying to learn German so that they could be employed as translators. It was not a happy time for either of them, but Wordsworth was writing some of his most enduring poems. First, his enigmatic group of Lucy poems, short elegiac lyrics which seemed to be concerned with the death of a young, beautiful, completely natural girl. The identity of Lucy herself has puzzled generations of scholars and commentators. Was she a lost love of his childhood? Is she in some sense an imagined version of his sister Dorothy? Coleridge, one of Wordsworth's closest friends, commented on one of the poems in a letter to a friend. He writes, whether it had any reality, I cannot say. Most probably in some gloomier moment, he had fancied the moment when his sister might die. Whatever the answer, which we shall probably never know, these eight lines make a powerful and passionate memorial. A slumber did my spirit seal. I had no human fear. She seemed a thing that could not feel the touch of earthly years. No motion has she now, no force. She neither hears nor sees. 
rolled round in earth's diurnal course with rocks and stones and trees. The other poem he began during that German winter when he was in his late twenties was something much longer, something at the very center of his life and something which occupied him on and off for the rest of that life. But it was not published, in fact, until a couple of months after Wordsworth's death in 1850. Although he'd substantially finished it 45 years earlier, he'd gone back to it and tinkered with it ever afterwards. This major work was what became known as the Prelude, but Wordsworth himself gave it other names, which eventually were used as subtitles, The Growth of a Poet's Mind, an autobiographical poem. Without knowing how it would turn out, in a mood of physical depression and mental uncertainty, Wordsworth in Germany began to explore his own beginnings, his free and happy childhood in Cumberland, and what he called those spots of time which lingered in his memory as moments of visionary strength. And those are always the moments of Wordsworth's greatest poetic strength, when he moves excitedly even exaltedly from the circumstantial when his memory catches fire. The inspiration of part of the prelude can be seen in a poem written when he was 29 with the weighty and somewhat formidable title, <laughs> Influence of Natural Objects and Calling Forth and Strengthening the Imagination in Early Youth. This was first published as a separate piece in a magazine edited by Coleridge and with the line you'll hear in a moment, Wisdom and Spirit of the Universe. The earlier lines, up to and including the description of taking the boat out and being frightened, came later. But the prelude as a whole, as we read it now, is a very carefully unified poem, taking Wordsworth from his boyhood and school days on to Cambridge, then his journey through the Alps, his time in London and his time in France towards his rediscovery of powers of imagination and spiritual strength, which he thought he had lost. In a way, it's a poem about paradise, about its loss and its regaining, which follows reverently but highly originally in the footsteps of Milton. Dust as we are, the immortal spirit grows like harmony in music. There is a dark, inscrutable workmanship that reconciles discordant elements, makes them cling together in one society. How strange that all the terrors, pains, and early miseries, regrets, vexations, lassitudes interfused within my mind, should e'er have borne a part, and that a needful part, in making up the calm existence that is mine when I am worthy of myself. Praise to the end. Thanks to the means which nature deigned to employ. Whether her fearless visitings, or those that came with soft alarm, like hurtless light opening the peaceful clouds. Or she may use severer interventions, ministry more palpable, as best might suit her aim. One summer evening, led by her, I found a little boat tied to a willow tree within a rocky cave, its usual home. Straight I unloosed her chain and, stepping in, pushed from the shore. It was an act of stealth and troubled pleasure, nor without the voice of mountain echoes did my boat move on, leaving behind her still on either side small circles glittering idly in the moon until they melted all into one track of sparkling light. But now, like one who rose proud of his skill to reach a chosen point with an unswerving line, I fixed my view upon the summit of a craggy ridge, the horizon's utmost boundary, for above was nothing but the stars and the grey sky. She was an elfin pinnace. Lustily, I dipped my oars into the silent lake, and as I rose upon the stroke, my boat went heaving through the water like a swan. When, from behind that craggy steep, till then the horizon's bound, a huge peak, black and huge, as if with voluntary power instinct, upreared its head. 
I struck and struck again, and growing still in stature, the grim shape towered up between me and the stars, and still, for so it seemed, with purpose of its own, and measured motion like a living thing, strode after me. With trembling oars I turned, and through the silent water stole my way back to the covert of the willow tree. There in her mooring place I left my bark, and through the meadows homeward went in grave and serious mood. But after I had seen that spectacle, for many days my brain worked with a dim and undetermined sense of unknown modes of being. Or my thoughts there hung a darkness, call it solitude or blank desertion. No familiar shapes remained, no pleasant images of trees, of sea or sky, no colors of green fields but huge and mighty forms that do not live like living men, moved slowly through the mind by day and were a trouble to my dream. Wisdom and spirit of the universe, thou soul that art the eternity of thought, that givest to forms and images a breath and everlasting motion. Not in vain by day or starlight, Thus, from my first dawn of childhood, didst thou intertwine for me the passions that build up our human soul. Not with the mean and vulgar works of man, but with high objects, with enduring things, with life and nature, purifying thus the elements of feeling and of thought, and sanctifying by such discipline both pain and fear, until we recognize a grandeur in the beatings of the heart. Nor was this fellowship vouchsafed to me with stinted kindness. In November days, when vapors rolling down the valley made a lonely scene more lonesome, among woods, at noon and mid the calm of summer night, when by the margin of the trembling lake, beneath the gloomy hills, homeward I went in solitude, such intercourse was mine. Mine was it in the fields, both day and night, and by the waters all the summer long. And in the frosty season, when the sun was set, and visible for many a mile the cottage windows blazed through twilight gloom, I heeded not their summons. Happy time it was indeed for all of us. For me, it was a time of rapture. Clear and loud, the village clock tolled six. I wheeled about, proud and exulting, like an untired horse that cares not for his home. All shod with steel, we hissed along the polished ice in games confederate, imitative of the chase and woodland pleasures. The resounding horn, the pack hound chiming, and the hunted hare. So through the darkness and the cold we flew, and not a voice was idle. With the din smitten, the precipices rang aloud. The leafless trees and every icy crag tinkled like iron while far distant hills into the tumult sent an alien sound of melancholy, not unnoticed, while the stars eastward were sparkling clear, and in the west the orange sky of evening died away. Not seldom from the uproar, I retired into a silent bay, or sportively glanced sideway, leaving the tumultuous throng to cut across the reflex of a star that fled and flying still before me gleamed upon the glassy plain. And oftentimes, when we had given our bodies to the wind and all the shadowy banks on either side came sweeping through the darkness, spinning still the rapid line of motion, then at once have I, reclining back upon my heels, stopped short. Yet still the solitary cliffs wheeled by me even as if the earth had rolled with visible motion her diurnal round. Behind me did they stretch in solemn train, feebler and feebler. And I stood and watched till all was tranquil as a dreamless sleep. Wordsworth said of the prelude, indeed of his work in general, that it was a thing unprecedented in literary history that a man should talk so much about himself. But he wasn't just impregnably solitary. As well as his sister Dorothy, 
There was his wife, Mary, to whom he wrote many tender and loving letters, which have only quite recently been discovered and published. And there were his five much-loved children and many other friends, literary and non-literary people alike. Surviving till he was 80 years old, he outlived most of them. And he went on writing to the end, though seldom regained the power of those ten marvellous years of writing from 1797. But much later, in his 66th year at Rydal Mount, he was stirred into moving eloquence by the death of an old friend. In 1835, James Hogg died, the Ettrick Shepherd, as he was known. And indeed, he was born in Ettrick Forest in Scotland and had worked as a shepherd. Hogg had been taken up by Walter Scott and had made the acquaintance, sometimes the friendship, of a lot of literary notables in the 1810s and 1820s, including Wordsworth. Wordsworth and Hogg had been born in exactly the same year, 1770, and on Hogg's death, Wordsworth wrote what he called an extempore effusion. In it, he commemorates not only Hogg, but Scott, Coleridge, Charles Lamb, and George Crabbe, writers all dead by now who had been his friends. Wordsworth speaks of a frail survivor. By this time, the finest poets of the generation that followed him, Shelley, Keats, and Byron, had all died young. And the poem is a poignant moment in an old man's life. When first, descending from the moorland, I saw the stream of Yarrow glide along a bare and open valley, the Ettrick Shepherd was my guide. When last along its banks I wandered, through groves that had begun to shed their golden leaves upon the pathways, my steps the border minstrel led. The mighty minstrel breathes no longer. Mid mouldering ruins low he lies, and death upon the braes of Yarrow has closed the shepherd poet's eyes. Nor has the rolling year twice measured from sign to sign its steadfast course since every mortal power of Coleridge was frozen at its marvellous source. The rapt one of the godlike forehead, the heaven-eyed creature sleeps in earth, and Lamb, the frolic and the gentle, has vanished from his lonely hearth. Like clouds that rake the mountain summits, or waves that own no curbing hand. How fast has brother followed brother from sunshine to the sunless land? Yet I, whose lids from infant slumber were earlier raised, remain to hear a timid voice that asks in whispers, who next will drop and disappear? Our haughty life is crowned with darkness, like London, with its own black reef, on which with thee, O oh crab, forth-looking, I gazed from Hampstead's breezy heath, as if but yesterday departed, thou too art gone before. But why, o'er ripe fruit, seasonably gathered, should frail survivors heave a sigh? Mourn rather for that holy spirit Sweet as the spring, as ocean deep, for her who, ere her summer faded, has sunk into a breathless sleep. No more of old romantic sorrows for slaughtered youth or love-lorn maid. With sharper grief is Yarrow smitten, and Ettrick mourns with her, their poet dead. 